As we begin this lesson, I'd like to offer my thanks to the Milestone Elders, uh, to Guyton Montgomery and Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies for the opportunity to present this lesson, as well as for the topics in this series of lessons. Uh, this has been a several year project and uh, the lessons that we have are just excellent. I've learned much from uh, the things that we've talked about. There truly are lessons that we can learn from history. History does repeat itself and some of the things that the Restoration Fathers uh, dealt with in their day are things that, though with a little different flavor, we're dealing with some of them today as well. So as we go through this lesson today, we're going to spend some time looking at denominational worship during the Restoration era, because that's a little different than uh, what you would see today. And we're going to take a look at what needed to be restored, and then we're going to make some modern application from those principles today. So as we go back to the situation in the 1700s, let's talk first about Catholicism. It may surprise some people that uh, the Catholic Mass was spoken in Latin until about the middle of the 20th century. Today, there are still places where Catholic Mass is celebrated in Latin. They call that the Extraordinary Mass, as opposed to the Ordinary Mass, which is done in the local vernacular. Obviously, by using a foreign language that people hadn't studied, the things that are said during the Mass are not common to them are not things that they're used to. And as a result, things are a little bit different there uh, during the, the service as well. So as people are celebrating Mass in this language that they haven't studied, there's a lot uh, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't appeal to the rational mind because they don't understand what's going on. They are truly going through uh, their tradition and their history. Even in the, the local vernacular, they, uh, the worship is done in a very specified way. They use what's called a liturgy or an order of worship. And for the Catholics, that's something that's dictated by the church. The English word liturgy is really just a transliteration of the Greek word referring to public service, like we would see in, in Romans chapter 13 and verse 6. But it's also used in Jewish and Christian literature for, during the early Christian era, predominantly for the religious service. So, so liturgy is a, a word that uh, has uh, meaning back to the first century. But the way it was developed in that 17th century Catholic uh, service, there was a lot of back and forth recitation between the priest and the parishioners. Uh, he would say something or, or sing something, and they would respond. Back and forth, they go. There was a lot of pomp and circumstance involved. In fact, in preparing for this lesson, I watched a recreation of a 15th century uh, mass that was celebrated in Latin. And through it, there was a lot of uh, like what we would refer to as Gregorian chants and different things that the priest was doing uh, with somebody else doing the chanting in the background. Uh, there was a, a lot of formality to the things that he was doing. And at times there was the back and forth between uh, the congregation and the priest himself. Now as the Catholics brought their religion here to the United States, uh, several interesting things occurred, especially in the southwestern part of the country, where Catholicism really began to take hold. The Franciscan monks, uh, according to Wainwright and Westerfield, came with a willingness to connect Christian practices with the indigenous religion for the sake of evangelism and instruction. So you ended up with this hybrid religion that some Catholicism, some of their traditional native religion, just meshed together uh, into something that was unique and new and not uh, according to the Catholic tradition of the day. We've talked a bit about Catholicism, but the mainline denominations had a little bit of different worship, things that would seem odd to them today. For instance, uh, the, the worship consisted mostly of prayer, scripture reading, preaching, and singing. 
that was the majority of it. Whereas in the Catholic tradition, you had a lot of liturgy back and forth. Uh, you didn't have that as much in the mainline denominations. Now, the order of service and the things that they said, the things that they did, was generally dictated uh, by their uh, religious hierarchy, but it would also be varied based upon the local situation. Also, it's interesting to note that within the mainline denominations in the 17th century, they mainly featured a cappella music with no choirs. So the singing that they engaged with would be very common and, and very comfortable to a New Testament Christian today. That was what they dealt with. However, regarding the Lord's Supper, they would take it only occasionally, typically annually or monthly. And we'll talk some more about that later in the lesson. Now, among the Puritan and congregational uh, congregations, uh, you know, these would be uh, the pilgrims who came over and, and folks who were trying to get to the fundamentals of uh, Christianity. Their worship tended to consist of both morning and afternoon services. Uh, sermons rarely would last less than an hour. Uh, there were, that was a major focus of what they were uh, coming together to do. Uh, Wayne White and Westerfield, Westerfield also said, uh, regarding this period of time, the Psalms were rendered without instrument accompaniment since such was not explicitly commanded by God. So this was their own attempt to restore New Testament worship. And we can see that this very closely resembles, in many ways, New Testament worship. They did, uh, did their best to try to restore that, and that's, that was their attempt. And I think as we talk about this period of time, we need to give them credit for that attempt, trying to do uh, things according to the New Testament pattern to the best of their ability. Now, throughout the 18th century and beyond, going from, from that point forward, Christian worship in North America was influenced by two specific and distinct movements that had developed in Europe in the 17th century, pietism and rationalism. First off, pietism. This was uh, a greater attention to the use of the scriptures as seen in the first great awakening of the 17th century. Now, pietism began within the Lutheran church, this idea of, of paying attention to what the scripture says, uh, but it soon spread outward from there. And, and this idea of pietism was significant in, in both the, the Methodist and the Anabaptist church establishment. Now, realize that this is kind of an uh, interesting period of time because uh, in the late uh, 15th century is when the printing press began to be used and, and people are now beginning to have copies of the scripture so they can read for themselves. Uh, translation was something fairly new as well. People can begin to read for themselves what the scriptures say and they can begin to think about it and pay attention to the meaning of the words. Uh, Satan's grip on the scriptures has been released and people are having the ability to study for themselves. So in addition to this pietism, you also have uh, rationalism, uh, which is uh, human reasoning and intellect, using that, thinking about it, and properly reasoning uh, from the information that you have. And the effect this had on worship is worship's task is was seen to instruct and to edify. You see, especially back in the Catholic uh, liturgy, you had a lot of pomp and circumstance and, and in a foreign language. So there was not instruction or edification going on there. It was going through the tradition and the ritual uh, that was worship. So here with rationalism, we got a little different flavor. We're instructing and we're edifying. And, and the lengthy liturgical texts that were sent down by the denominations are, are beginning to lose favor, that things are becoming more specific to the local congregation. Again, that's a trend that, uh, that we would be fully in favor of. And during this time with rationalism, preaching became a major focus of the worship service. This became uh, primarily uh, what was happening. And, and even today, when you look at a, a, shall we say, a typical worship service, uh, 
uh, that lasts maybe an hour, by far the most time that we spend uh, would be on the preaching. You know, singing would probably uh, be second after that, but preaching would be the, the primary focus uh, in most of our churches today. During this period of time, we also have uh, what's referred to as revivalism. And, and this is uh, early in the 1800s, after the fervor of the Great Awakening uh, had diminished in the late 1700s, we have this revivalism coming. What is that? Uh, it was typical in the American South, and, and this would encompass open-air meetings lasting for many days with hundreds and sometimes thousands of people gathering together, uh, participating. You'd have dozens and sometimes hundreds of conversions. Uh, these are like big gospel meetings uh, that were social events in addition to their religious nature, that people would travel sometimes for miles to come and, and have a camp out and uh, do things during the day and, and socialize with people. And then there would be preaching and, and, and the service in the evening. And these things would go on sometimes for many weeks. And, and the group that would gather for this tended to be mixed, numerous denominations together at these revivals. And, and they would get together and, and, and deal with some of these things despite the doctrinal and racial differences. Uh, interesting, this is one area, especially in the American South, where races came together for religious purposes, uh, something that... Uh, definitely was uh, uh, unique in that period in time. And, and this uh, system of, of gospel meetings uh, out in the country eventually led as people moved into the cities to these urban protracted meetings in, in large auditoriums, and, and that developed even early into the 20th century. And that would be something uh, like the Hard, Hardeman's uh, Tabernacle Servants, that he did at the Ryman Auditorium uh, back over 100 years ago, that would be uh, typical of that type of uh, event. Now, churches that adopted uh, these gospel meetings and, and revivals tended to grow rapidly uh, through their use. Uh, they were quite the social event, quite the religious event, and resulted in a lot of people being very interested in religious material. And this really laid the groundwork, the perfect setting for the American Restoration Movement to expand very rapidly. At one of these events, you could reach hundreds and thousands of people at a time and convert sometimes entire congregations to New Testament Christianity. Now, during the early uh, 1800s, remember, instrumental music was virtually unknown among evangelical churches. Uh, and every time it was introduced, the denomination struggled, even to the point of division. You know, today, instrumental music is, is pretty much accepted by just about every denomination. But back just a few hundred years ago, it was not the case. Most understood the authority of the Scriptures. The Methodists began adding an organ prelude at the beginning of their service, before the worship began, kind of music that people would listen to as they walked in. Very soon thereafter, they added a song by a choir into the worship service, and that pretty much became standard by 1900. By the end of the 19th century, according to Wayne White and Westerfield, most had accepted organs. So we see these things being introduced slowly into the worship service. Another thing that we see in, in uh, this period of time as, as worship developed is preaching became more formal. And they stopped calling it just preaching and, and called it a sermon. You reflect the middle class respectability of the day. You know, this is when we started to get uh, sermons of three points in a poem, alliteration, and focus on things such as that. The preaching became a little bit more structured. There was more form to it. Social issues were very important during this time as well. Uh, many religious songs that they were singing during these days reflected social issues and things that they were dealing with. Anti-slavery songs uh, 
predated the Civil War and were very popular during those days. Abstinence from alcohol was a common theme in their singing, something we typically don't see today. Interestingly, as we talk about alcohol, uh, in 1870, a very significant event in so many ways, Dr. Welch's unfermented wine became popular. It was introduced and helped push the entire country toward prohibition. You see, people had been talking about uh, the problems with uh, recreational use of alcohol and temperance was being promoted, even in their songs. But the problem is, in that day, uh, the way the marketing had developed, many congregations were having to use alcoholic communion wine necessarily in their worship because they couldn't get unfermented. Uh, thus, there was an, uh, a hesitance to support a total prohibition of alcohol because people needed to get to their communion wine. So churches were not pushing for prohibition, even though they were teaching against recreational alcohol use. Well, with Dr. Welch's unfermented grape juice, now there was no excuse for alcohol, and the total prohibition would be accept the, accepted by nearly everyone who claimed Christianity. Think about that. Uh, that's not the case today. Many denominations uh, allow and sometimes even celebrate the use of recreational alcohol. Many still use it when they partake of the Lord's Supper. During this period of time regarding the Lord's Supper, groups were grappling with a common cup versus multiple individual cups uh, during this same period of time. And they talked about the sanitary nature of multiple cups, the traditional of the single cup. It'll be interesting in our day uh, with, with the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, will those common cups go away even more than they had before and, and more go to the multiple cup for the sanitary purposes? Uh, we will see how that develops. Another interesting invention, 1880, the mimeograph was uh, developed and began to be marketed. That would, uh, uh, for those of you of a younger generation, it was uh, a precursor to a, a copier, a copy machine. Mimeograph, you would uh, print something on a stencil and run it through a machine and uh, create copies that way. Uh, but the introduction of the mimeograph allowed congregations to print their own order of service in their own bulletins that could be distributed to the whole congregation. This was a new concept. Before this, things were either printed on a printing press or copied by hand. This allowed people to uh, really to bring printing to the masses. And it also allowed for more local autonomy in the congregation regarding the order of worship. Uh, that's something that historically had been dictated by the denomination, now it, they were decisions that could be made locally. So when we talk about the restoration process and restoring New Testament worship in that era, we have to realize that that era looked quite a bit different than worship today. Uh, there were some things that we struggle with and, and deal with and grapple with today that weren't even issues in that day. Uh, for instance, um, you know, on their own, uh, many denominations were already getting rid of these ritualized prayers that somebody would read something that somebody else had given. This is the prayer that you are to say at this point in the service on this particular day. Things like that were, were laid out for them. Now, uh, people could do spontaneous prayers in the worship. The singing, uh, you know, most denominational religious services were indeed a cappella at this time. And the widespread adoption of choirs hadn't happened yet. So they're, they weren't talking about instrumental music as much as we are today. We weren't having to talk about uh, the adoption of, of choirs. Uh, 
and, and praise teams. Uh, also, during this period of time regarding the singing, many of the great traditional hymns that we still sing today, they were written during this period of time. Regarding the restoration of the Lord's Supper, the, well, the subject of transubstantiation, uh, that the, the bread and the fruit of the vine literally became body and blood, the Reformation leaders had already dealt with that error, and, and that was pretty much uh, specific to the Catholic Church at this point in time. Everybody else had gotten away from transubstantiation. The push away from alcoholic wine was well underway, uh, and we had that common individual cup uh, controversy that was uh, plaguing some denominations. Interestingly, some denominationalists were arguing for a weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. That we can see from the scriptures uh, that was celebrated every first day of the week. We can see that pattern there in the New Testament. And as people read their New Testament, saw that pattern, they were arguing, we need to do this on a weekly basis. Uh, so that wasn't something that was radical to the people of that day. That's something uh, that they would be used to. The preaching, you know, we talked about that, that change in the trends of preaching. The lessons across denominations transitioned to being more rational and, and more convincing of the mind as opposed to uh, uh, something that was just mere uh, rote memorization, uh, rote script that somebody had given. In addition, with the uh, translation of the scriptures, the printing press, and the availability of Bibles, the average person in the pew had a Bible available. And during the sermon, they could now search the scriptures for themselves to see if the things were so, Acts 17, 11. That's something that had been missing from the church uh, and, and most of Christianity for quite a while. But now they could do that, and they were doing that, and they were following along, and they were uh, comparing to the Word of God, not always agreeing, and sometimes bringing things up and having discussions uh, about these scriptural matters. Uh, due to the mindset following the Reformation, you know, people were now okay with challenging the status quo. Over a thousand years, most people professing Christianity had followed the Catholic Church blindly uh, because they didn't have copies of the Scriptures, they didn't have the ability to read, they didn't have the ability to deal into that material. Now that they do, and they realize we can challenge this authority because the Bible is the authority. And we had that mindset that was creeping into Christianity. Uh, and denominationalism, and people looking to the Scripture for authority. Well, that's exactly what New Testament Christianity is all about, going to the Bible for the authority. And as we see that, uh, we can see how things became ripe for the Restoration Fathers to restore that New Testament church and how it could grow so quickly because so many things had been laid down just perfectly set up for this to occur here in the United States. What the Restoration Fathers began to do was fight against the introduction of unauthorized items that were being adopted by some of the denominations. Uh, for instance, with singing. Uh, singing was a cappella, and uh, that was the common thing uh, as the Restoration Movement began. One author has said, our practice of singing spiritual songs and hymns and making melody with our hearts unto the Lord is not in question. Our practice occasions no controversy. It is what we do not practice, the practice of others using the instrument that causes all the, uh, all the controversy. We are silent upon the use of instrumental music in worship because the New Testament is silent on this point. Our answer to all inquiries on, our, on this matter is, we do not use instrumental music in worship because there is no authority for it in the New Testament. That was G.C. Brewer uh, who gave us that quote. That was what everybody was believing 
uh, as the restoration began, or for the most part, and they were introducing instrumental music as time went by. So we're not the ones who moved, they were. It's interesting in talking to folks from denominations today, it seems to them odd that we wouldn't use the instrument. And the whole framework has come to oftentimes trying to defend not using an instrument, where really the conversation needs to be they need to defend where they find authority to use the instrument. That's where the discussion needs to be. We also see a similar practice with introducing choirs and choruses into the worship assembly. That's something that wasn't done before. Uh, People understood the reciprocal reflexive pronoun, singing to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual uh, songs. That to one another, everybody is participating, and everybody is hearing. That's what the text of the New Testament says. So there's no authority for these choirs and choruses within the New Testament worship. They didn't have them. They began introducing them. And we had to argue against the introduction of things that were not authorized. We see uh, moving away from the liturgy uh, for some denominations, that ushered in the period where they understood that worship is not uh, rote recitation. It's it's not pomp and circumstance. It's a human being uh, fellowshipping with God in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. So we see that relationship that should be there. That's the essence of worship. And we see the frequency of the Lord's Supper and and, and moving away from routine and sometimes unison prayers uh, that we had uh, uh, developed. That process had already started. The Restoration Fathers didn't have to move uh, people very far at all during that day. So that was the historical restoration. What about restoring New Testament worship today? Well, I think as we talk about this, we need to go very basic and ask the question, why does God desire man's worship? We can see from Revelation 4.11 and other passages, he is truly worthy of our worship, and he has been mindful of us, Psalm 8, verse 4. It's interesting, as you look through Scripture, you can see that God has always wanted to have fellowship with man. Back in the Garden of Eden, in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve had sinned and were hiding from God, who was it that asked, where are you? God was seeking out man. Isn't that the essence of John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Him reaching out to us. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, he desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Titus 2.11 teaches us that the grace that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So God's always extending out uh, that desire. He wants to have fellowship with us. He's desiring of that, desiring of that relationship. With that understanding, does it matter how we worship? Does it really make a difference? And we can see as we look through Scripture, God has always specified how He wants to be worshipped. Back in Genesis chapter 4, Cain's sacrifice was unacceptable to God. Abel's was accepted. Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, they were killed because of disobedience when they brought unauthorized fire before the Lord. He specified, this is what I want. They brought something else. And they were made an example so that everybody who approached God would know that God cares how we approach Him. King Saul was condemned for offering an unauthorized sacrifice. 1 Samuel 13, 
uh, beginning around verse 9 to verse 13. And we get to the New Testament, we can see Jesus said in John 4, 24, that we must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, if there's truth in worship, there must also be falsehood or error. So God is, is taking those lessons from the Old Testament, bringing them forward and saying, you still need to pay attention. You need to make sure that you worship in truth and not in error. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, he condemned vain or empty worship. Now that's something we can be guilty of today, specifically in that context. He said, when you follow the traditions of men instead of God, your worship is empty. When we follow somebody else's commands for worship and not God's, our worship is empty. When we follow our own desires instead of God's, our worship is empty. You know, that's oftentimes what people do when they worship. What did, what did I get out of it? What is in there for me? Am I entertained? Am I uplifted by what I've done? Trying to please the self. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that when we worship God in spirit and in truth as He has commanded, it's not uplifting. Oh, it is. But not because I got something out of it, because of what I gave when I was there. That builds me up. That uplifts me. That needs to be my focus. And we may be sitting there going through all the motions, but when we're not mentally engaged in what we're doing, our worship then is empty as well. Brother Odell said that since man means so much to God, worship has the capacity to bring pleasure to God. When man worships God correctly, there is no doubt that God receives great satisfaction from it. He delights in our worship. And as we understand that, it really is the height of arrogance man's arrogance to dictate to the creator of the universe how he is to be worshipped. I know what you said, but this is what I've decided I want to give you. Who am I to dictate that to God? And as you worship God, are you truly engaging in New Testament worship? Oh, as a collective body, we're doing things according to truth. But when you're singing... Are you making melody in your heart? Is your brain fully engaged in the, the words that are being sung? As we pray together collectively, are you laying, are you laying your petitions before His altar? Or is your mind wandering to something else? Are you focused on the task at hand? Have you restored New Testament worship in your life? During the Lord's Supper, are you remembering that great sacrifice and your need for that forgiving blood? Your need for that death on the cross? If your mind's not remembering and engaged in that way, you're not worshiping uh, according to the New Testament pattern. When it's time to give, do you give of your first fruits joyfully? Do you, do you desire and, and have this want to give more? During the preaching, are you examining the text, looking at yourself and making corrections to your life? That's restoring New Testament worship in your life. You know, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4 tells us that God is present when man worships him. God testifies of Abel's worship. He's a person who is there. Worship is not some kind of ego trip for God. He didn't develop worship for His benefit, but for our benefit. It helps to remind us of who He is. Uh, allows us to come before Him for our benefit, allows us to give him his praise. I get much out of that. 
helping me realize how awesome He is and how much I need Him. And the fact that God allows us to have a relationship with Him, it really is kind of mind-boggling. That's what the psalmist was contemplating when he wrote in Psalm 8, verse 4, What is man that you're mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? It truly is amazing that the creator of the universe cares about the time that we spend together on the first day of the week. So as we wrap this up and think about restoring New Testament worship, we must do it both collectively and individually. As a group of Christians gathered together, we must make sure that we engage in those activities that are commanded by God in the New Testament, that we do things according to the pattern of the New Testament, do things decently and in order, 1 Corinthians 14.40, so that those who are present can focus upon God. We also need to worship individually, properly engage our mind within this setting. Things are being done scripturally, collectively, and I as an individual worshiping properly, fully engaged in what I'm doing. Restoration of New Testament worship is something that each and every one of us can do each and every Lord's Day. Thank you so much for the time together. I hope and pray that as we've studied these materials, they've been of benefit to you.